Caracato. Hi, everybody. Hi, Mark. Hi, Kara. Kato, is your sound working? Yep, I think so. Okay. Yep, we're all good. Very good, very good. Well, thanks everybody for being with us this afternoon. Uh, we have seen a ton of interesting stuff uh, so far today, everything from spinal surgery to uh, workplace stress reduction. I think now we're gonna take a totally different turn, uh, going from sort of the at least life size or bigger to the nano size. Uh, today we have uh, Kara Bortoni from uh, Johnson & Johnson's uh, J Labs group and Keita Funakawa from, uh, is that my pronounce it, Nanome or Nanomi? Uh, it's uh, Nanome, like genome. Nano, got it. Okay, mm -hmm. and so they're going to talk about uh, you know Nanom's uh, approach to basically molecular research and three D visualization. So with that, I'll turn it over to you guys. Take it away. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mark, and it's really my pleasure to be here today with Kada to tell you a little bit about Nano um, and talk about why uh, Nano really saw a need uh, in this in this field. Um, and I'd really love to start, Kata, if you could, um, with talking about that problem that you're addressing and describe how your approach really solves that problem. Yeah, so uh, my name is Kata Funakawa. I'm the uh, COO and co-founder. Um, a little bit about Nanom uh, and its background. So uh, we spun out of uh, UC San Diego. Um, our CEO, he's back there actually. Oh wait, that, there, that's, that's our CEO. Um, he's actually uh, one of the first undergraduate class members of the first nanoengineering department uh, in the world, which happens to be uh, at UC San Diego. Um, and so really, you know, um, the idea behind what we do and, and why we're doing it um, stemmed out of the fact that when he was learning about molecular systems and nanoscale systems, um, you know, why are we still using blackboards? And even if it's computers, why are we still using uh, 2D screens in order to look at these extremely complex, um, long and twisted uh, three-dimensional molecular structures. Um, and so what's interesting was that, you know, his initial, uh, Steve, his, his initial idea was to actually use uh, video game engines um, because as millennials, you know, we, we grew up with video games and we know how graphics uh, could get amazing. Um, and so the initial idea was to try to use game engines. Um, but it was also the same time when, you know, the Oculus DK2 um, was getting popular. And uh, so he said, hey, let's try it out. And actually, that's when I met him was uh, I'm more from the computer science and media background. Uh, and I met him at a, uh, a school film festival, which is about kind of the future of film um, and uh, the future of digital media. And so it was all about virtual reality that year with a bunch of Google Cardboards and um, so that's how kind of uh, we met. And um, yeah, it was, you know, fundamentally, you know, science is in 3D, uh, why do it in 2D was kind of uh, the, the thing that we were trying to tackle. Um, and then, you know, through a bunch of, of uh, uh, college uh, kind of like, you know, entrepreneur programs and startup programs, we looked at all, all the different types of markets that they're out there for molecular visualization and simulation. And we found that uh, protein visualization um, and small molecule drug discovery uh, were some of the kind of the most uh, existing, uh, had the most existing market demand for these types of visualization and simulation. Um, and so that's kind of how we ended up here. So we're really starting with the uh, drug discovery um, as well as kind of the organic side of molecular visualization and design. But really, you know, um, we're, we want to tackle everything at the nanoscale uh, eventually. Um, and what's exciting is probably the crossover between the inorganic and the organic, as we're seeing with a lot of research these days um, with uh, nanoscale designs. So anyways, I know that was a kind of a long backstory there, but I figured I'd give more context. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. It's always um, very, I think that's always where you see the most innovation at the forefront of these fields that come together when you bring together tools that, you know, were previously used in things like you said, video gaming and, uh, mm -hmm. and how you kind of put that together with uh, science. So I'm moving it forward. Um, and so I, I think really, you know, obviously you've answered the idea of how you came, came up with the idea. Um, do, how do you feel that this virtual reality space is really the best way to, to drive this technology forward? And what does that give you that maybe another approach wouldn't? Definitely. Um, so yeah, to be clear, we, we only just, you know, make the software. Um, we, we use off the shelf consumer hardware, um, like, you know, HTC Vive, Oculus uh, Quest, Windows Mixed Reality, those kind of things. So 
um, uh, for our, us as a software company, we like to think that there's kind of three core pillars or three parts of the, the same core um, that really drive our software forward and, and, uh, and per serve as a kind of value proposition. So um, those three, three uh, value propositions slash pillars are uh, intuitive slash immersive. They're kind of inter interchangeable. Second one is collaborative. So that's real-time collaboration. And then the third one is uh, integrated. Um, and so, you know, what I like to say is that there's really no uh, kind of similar tool like Google Docs um, to molecular editing, right? So you can't have a bunch of scientists together in, uh, you know, on this one, uh, whether it's just one screen, there, there are kind of semi tools um, for collaboration uh, in the molecular editing and molecular simulation. Um, but, you know, when we did a bunch of our market research, like the state of the art for uh, molecular collaboration was using exactly like this, where we have a, a Zoom session and you have a screen share and there's a scientist with a mouse and a keyboard trying to point out a very complex, you know, binding site in a protein. Um, hey, like this is the hydrogen bond that we're trying to target or things like that. And, and so, um, you know, especially with, uh, you know, video games having a lot of kind of multi-user, multiplayer type collaboration systems integrated, that's one of the first things that we wanted to make sure we, we got down. And that, you know, the, the separation between the immersiveness and the collaboration isn't super clear. There's no exact line that separates them. Um, they bleed over and it's more of a spectrum. Um, you know, a lot of our users say that, um, you know, because of the, the obviousness um, of the structures in an immersive environment, that they're able to bring in non-experts that wouldn't have otherwise been able to contribute. Um, and so this, you know, it obviously uh, allows for more types of collaboration uh, than just a, a simple kind of Google Docs type interface, right? So um, that's one part. And then, you know, the, the immersiveness and one thing that I want to really lean in towards um, that, you know, a lot of people say, okay, well, you know, what's, why is VR so much better uh, than, you know, 3D TVs or uh, what's actually funny if you kind of research, do a little bit of research into this uh, field of molecular visualization is that, uh, you know, these researchers have been trying to get a, a 3D understanding of these structures for so long um, that, you know, a lot of our users, when we visited their labs, they would have like the old school green and, and red uh, 3D glasses that you would see and just to be able to, you know, see the, the intuition uh, behind the 3D structure. Um, and so, the, you know, when they first find vir like modern virtual reality, they're like, oh my God, we've been waiting for this for, you know, 30, 40 years, right? So, um, but anyways, you know, th these are people that are, are very, you know, enthusiastic about the things and uh, a lot of, you know, people who aren't as familiar ask why VR is so much better. And it's obviously very difficult to try to describe, you know, the experience, but um, one tangible thing that I can point out is that we've had users say that there are insights that they can only gain within virtual reality that they would have missed otherwise if it were, you know, 2D or, you know, maybe even a, a 3D TV and things like that. Um, not just because of the stereoscopic 3D, but also because of the fact that, you know, you have uh, ta almost tactile um, kind of feedback as you're able to use your hands to intuitively navigate. So those are kind of the, the core value proposition. And, and lastly, I, you know, I touched on this, which is the integration, integrated part. Um, molecular simulation and computational chemistry is an extremely, you know, sophisticated field. And I'm not going to pretend like I'm an expert. I, I, my background is different, but luckily we have customers that are experts. And, you know, we have a lot of customers that, prefer a lot of different types of simulations. So um, instead of only making one type of simulation available, we're very simulation agnostic. So whether it's you know, a, a very proprietary closed sourced uh, algorithm that you might have or an open source uh, you know, university driven um, uh, algorithm that you might have for docking a protein or something like that, um, we're very agnostic. So you can just plug and play within a virtual reality headset. And, and kind of this ties into our immersiveness uh, aspect of it because um, when scientists are working with a bunch of different types of software, they don't have to take off the headset in order to switch to one of their tools that they already use. They can just use it within our virtual reality environment. So, um, you know, that's kind of, uh, that's one of the reasons why we have our customers uh, tell us that we're um, uh, the glue that kind of brings together not just different scientists and different backgrounds, but also the different types of software that they already use. That's really interesting. And I really appreciate what you said. And I was actually just when you were talking about it, thinking this is, um, you know, they've done studies before and actually some of the best people at protein modeling are not scientists at all. It's really taking like crowdsourcing all these different oh, yeah. ideas. Mm -hmm. It's democratizing really the ability to be able to do this work. So I, 
with that being said, who would you describe as your typical customer? Like they could maybe reach yeah. out to these these non-experts, but yeah. who is who is the person you're typically approaching in, in terms of uh, utilizing this technology? Yeah, um, answering that question is a uh, is multifaceted to say the least because uh, <laughs> you know especially uh, who your who is your customer from like a entrepreneurship startup perspective, and then who is your user from just like a pure you know, uh, software perspective um, is, is also drastically different. So what I like to say is that, you know, 90% of our users are in academia, um, but 90% of um, our customers or revenue uh, comes from a big, big pharma and biotech. Um, so we have uh, over a dozen of the top pharma companies. Um, unfortunately, I can't name them, but there are a lot of the top 15. Um, and uh, we also have a lot of the kind of up and coming biotechs as well as, as uh, some of our customers. And they use it anything from um, uh, protein engineering, antibody design, small molecule design, um, uh, to anything really that's at the uh, protein level, uh, protein or small molecule level, including actually COVID-19 uh, research. So that's something that we're very proud of, uh, is that there's a lot of research going on uh, for COVID-19 using our software, and we're bringing together all these types of scientists uh, that wouldn't have otherwise been collaborating. So that's, that's something really cool. Um, so yeah, that's, um, I guess if I were to kind of dive in deeper, um, you know, obviously like the amount and, you know, <laughs> Kara, you're familiar with this as you are at, at, at JL Labs and Johnson Johnson, but the average time it takes for a drug to get to market, um, is like you know, over 10 years, like $2 billion or something like that. Right. So these organizations are massive and, and there's tremendous amount of processes going on. So where we are is at the very, very early stage, um, in drug discovery. Uh, and uh, kind of like um, lead optimization where, you know, you have kind of an idea of uh, what a drug could be. You're looking at um, the results uh, in, you know, computers to see if that those are even viable candidates, right? So um, what we really want to do is to try to eliminate the physical um, excess, like failed results in real life so that then you can just test them in, in virtual reality. So um, you know, how I like to think about it from like a high level um, is that uh, you're simulating a metaverse, right? You're simulating a metaverse, but it's very, very, very small. And it's just a single protein and a single molecule um, so that then you don't make that mistake in this universe. Um, so that's kind of, you know, how we like to think about it. And, and really, that's kind of the ultimate goal of, of the company as well, is to have a metaverse that's atomically precise so that you can have these systems that are ex extremely complex and, and uh, design, simulate, and iterate within those environments. So... Um, anyways, I got off track there a little bit, so apologies for that. But, you know, to answer your question about kind of the target um, uh, users within these kind of large pharma organizations, um, specifically, we're looking at computational chemists, uh, medicinal chemists, and structural biologists uh, with some overlap with uh, crystallographers. Um, and I could go into detail about what each of them do, but those are kind of the, the key user types that uh, we, we target. Um, but one thing that I do want to touch upon is that um, you know, one of like at a foundational level, we're making a molecular modeling and simulation app that happens to be in VR. And when you do that, you um, have a molecular modeling kit that you never run out of parts and is always physically accurate, right? Or uh, physically accurate, meaning that it, in theory it could be accurate. And so, uh, what's super interesting is that um, because of that, we've actually launched on the uh, consumer VR app stores like Oculus and um, you know CMVR and things like that, and we've been able to get downloads from over 250 universities um, and, uh, and, and subset of those actually bought like classroom size bundles to teach anything from introduction to chemistry to uh, intermediate chemistry uh, all the way up to like advanced drug discovery courses. Um, because you know, if you just strip down all the other features that are more advanced for the researchers, you can get this really amazing um, you know, molecular visualization uh, app where you can see like, oh yeah, that's how the double helix of the DNA looks like. And, that's how a benzene ring looks compared to a six member carbon ring, right? So, um, and it's, it's very useful for, for that alone. Uh, but uh, like I said before, the you know, academia compared to big pharma doesn't have as big budgets. So that's why 90% of our users are in academia, but 90% of our revenue comes from uh, pharma. Makes sense, makes sense. And obviously those groups work closely together in a lot of cases too. So uh, often yeah. projects start in academia and then move over to, to pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, it's a great yeah. sales pipeline too, because yeah. you know, like we hear over and over again with uh, with that conferences um, or VR events, like, oh, if only we had this app, like I would have probably been a chemist, right? Or something like that. <laughs> and I would have understood you know, organic chemistry and the, all those crazy 3D uh, structures and things like that. And, and so, um, 
you know, the, the amount of uh, uh, organic chemists and, and medicinal chemists that, that were helped creating is, I'm sure, uh, uh, many that, that we, we don't know. Yeah, probably all the high school STEM programs would love you. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we get downloads from K through 12 schools too. And I'm like, well, I, I hope they understand it. You know, we have like, you know, family members of our team members that like, uh, actually even family members of our customers that use our software to teach their, their kids like organic chemistry, in addition to using it for like some, you know, advanced like cancer research and stuff like that. So it, it's kind of Very really cool. cool to see that spectrum. Yeah, 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 cool. So, um, you know, some of the things just in terms of, and I know maybe you could talk a little bit about a, a preview, I guess, of, of some of the work you're, you're going to have published, um, but maybe you could talk briefly about some of the value you're creating and, mm -hmm. and outcomes um, that you've been able yep. to demonstrate in terms, of, in terms of this approach. Yeah, um, so I think I mentioned before, you know, the, the insights that they're able to gain uh, in VR that they were otherwise would have missed. Uh, that's kind of like the biggest thing that, you know, um, I think we're leaning towards. Uh, we actually published a paper last year uh, with GNF Novartis, which is a, a San Diego site of, of Novartis. Um, and, uh, you know, that was about kind of uh, how our software was being used within a, uh, a structural analysis workflow of uh, proteins. Um, and so uh, that was actually published in the uh, Journal of Molecular Graphics um, and Modeling. So that's some, uh, a great case study and paper that I could link in the chat later as well. Um, but, you know, that kind of showed a little bit of a preview. I think it focused more on kind of like how VR could fit in a uh, molecular structural analysis workflow rather than like the ex exact efficacies or, or outcomes per se of using it. Um, but that's kind of what's in work in progress right now that we're looking to, to publish really shortly. Um, and so we're working with a, a small biotech to, to publish uh, this one case study. It's more of a non-scientific case study than a, than a you know, peer-reviewed case study per se, but it's really focusing down onto you know, how much cost savings that they were able to have because of the fact that they simulated within a virtual environment uh, and uh, uh, a VR instead of using a 2D screen or even physically testing it. Um, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, high, high throughput screening is, is one of the popular approaches to drug discovery right now. Um, and it's you know, physically testing thousands of thousands of different types of compounds and see if they are um, effective against target, right? And so mm -hmm. the less you do high throughput screening and the more you do it within a virtual environment, um, the more cost savings you're gonna have and things like that. So currently, you know, we're, we have kind of you know, initial results and testimonies saying that it's um, at, at a minimum, a single use of Nanom uh, is uh, saving companies up to you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so that's kind of uh, one of the res early results that we're getting, but uh, I'll have more to share in, in the coming uh, weeks and months. Great, great. So, um, you know, you mentioned uh, the different customer groups that you have. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of the um, models that you're using in terms of um, charging and access to the, mm -hmm. to the technology uh, and, and the approaches you're using there? Yeah, so, um, I, you know, at the basic, it's a software subscription annual license. So um you know we have an enterprise tier um <clears throat> that we're relatively flexible with pricing especially because you know we found that like you know top tier mega pharmas um they tend to be extremely conservative and skeptical when it comes to you know emerging technologies even if they have like an emerging technologies group and so um, they want to start off very very small and we want to make sure that we kind of you know fit within their budgets for that um and then the small biotechs were even more flexible because they usually have way less funding than the mega pharmas and then um, and, and also what's interesting with the small biotechs uh, with our experience is that the user personas that I just described, usually they hire like one person that has an overlap experience with like all of the above opposed to try to like hire one per persona. So um, that kind of, you know, trying to fit within their model and things like that um, is a, kind of a big um, thing that we try to consider. And then um, on the academic side, uh, we have um, like a pricing starting at 199 per license, but with like again, very flexible, extreme discounts, um, especially with this era of COVID-19. Um, we've had schools uh, like Ivy League schools use our uh, software for introduction to chemistry, uh, uh, remote learning and things like that. And um, so, you know, we're, we're not trying to make a buck out of, out of every instance of, uh, you know, COVID-19 remote use. So we kind of gave, gave a bunch of licenses away for free and things like that. So, uh, and then we also have a, a kind of a freemium tier where we do have some core features that are stripped out um, that you can just try for free. So if anybody has, uh, you know, a headset, you can download it onto um, uh, with the Oculus Store, Steam Store, or even on SideQuest as well. Um, so that's something that uh, you can try out and check out yourself.
Great, great. Well, it sounds like you have a lot of things going on, especially these days. And I know um, we, we talked briefly about, uh, and you know, seeing a lot of news about your approach in, in COVID-19. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, um, in terms of some of the collaborations you're doing uh, yep. in, the, in that space. Yeah, um, it's actually been quite incredible uh, in the past kind of, you know, nine months or so, I guess, however long the, the lockdowns have been. Um, the amount of kind of collaboration and traction that we've been getting has been way more uh, than, than her pa uh, previous years. Um, so I think it, it started off really in uh, around March. Um, we had one of our existing uh, users uh, at uh, Data61 CISRO, which is a uh, Australian government research lab, um, uh, you started to use our software for uh, looking at simulation results of COVID-19 and the spike protein. Um, and so it was, you know, I was one of the first ones to see the results of the spike protein actually attaching to the ACE2 uh, pro uh, molecule. And it was just like mind blowing, not just to actually see the, you know, the reason why I'm locked down in my house, but also because it was in our software too. Um, so that was kind of our, our first uh, type of, you know, uh, public collaboration and, and they're increasingly using it. Um, and again, they're, they're very much on the computational research side. So they're not necessarily designing a, uh, you know, a vaccine or anything like that, but they're passing on the insights that they gain from these simulations to these potential other vaccine researchers and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, another collaboration that we had was with a leading AI um, drug discovery company called In Silico Medicine out of uh, Taiwan and in Hong Kong. And um, what was really interesting, we actually published a preprint with them about uh, viewing and analyzing um, uh, uh, results generated by AI algorithms uh, by human medicinal chemists in virtual reality. So it's like a crazy title of, of a paper. I'm happy to link that as well. Um, but you know, it is, it is a preprint and uh, you know, they, they also were able to make these adjustments that they would have otherwise missed if it weren't for viewing and analyzing these um, results in virtual reality. So that was extremely cool as well. Um, but I mean, that's something, you know, if I were to kind of go on a tangent a little bit here, a lot of people say, you know, is it, you should, should, should we use AI or VR? And we really think it's complementary. Um, you know, we like to think about it as like kind of the centaur model, the half human, half horse, uh, where we can, you know, work together even more effectively, right? So um, it's not just the AI giving you, you know, black box AI, just like telling you that this is the best answer, but also looking at it in the best way possible through virtual reality, and then enhancing the AI algorithm by training it with better data, um, and then ultimately getting to a better result that then we can pass on to the patient, right? So um, that's, that's, uh, it was kind of like our first glimpse, and we've always, you know, talked about this within the company. So that preprint was a, a huge kind of first step forward in, in that direction. So that we were really happy about that. And then the two other big collaborations, uh, one is um, Escalate for Cove, which is a EU sponsored uh, government initiative um, for, it's a research consortium of, I think it was 17 or 19 uh, government research lab pharma companies in Europe. Uh, and we're actually the first American company to join that initiative. Um, and uh, we're helping researchers not only get connected within virtual reality to view you know, molecular uh, simulation results, but uh, connect with uh, one of the top supercomputers in um, Europe to uh, in initialize and also view some of the, the simulations that they're doing on COVID-19. So um, that was uh, also a really big one. We're, we're actively collaborating with them and we have like calls with them like every week to, to try to help them with their workflow and see how we can optimize uh, for their use case. Um, and then lastly, this is kind of unrelated from COVID-19, but Two weeks ago, we just signed a uh, reseller agreement with uh, the Japanese IT giant Fujitsu. So they're kind of like the IBM of Japan. Um, and uh, you know, I'm actually Jap half Japanese myself, and I grew up in Japan. And the Japanese like customer care and, and customer support standard is like very different from the U.S. And in the U.S., we, we could tell you know pharma companies like, okay, here's a software, here's where you can buy a headset, and um, here's where you can buy a computer. Good luck, and then we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Or kind of, but that doesn't work in Japan. So uh, Fujitsu is helping us really kind of make a white glove treatment and a packaged um, solution in Japan where they can combine their IT solutions. Um, they also, we act, are talking with their um, high performance compute group. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, earlier with Escalate for Cove, they're using, um, you know, supercomputers in conjunction with uh, AR and VR. Um, but uh, Fujitsu actually happens to be the maker of the most powerful supercomputer in the world. Um, and they want to be actually starting to integrate um, our solution in VR into uh, their supercompute solutions. So that's something we're very excited about. And so that that was a deal that we just closed. So we're we're very excited about that as well.
That's really exciting. And you know, my next question was really to ask, uh, you know, what's next for you in terms of technology? It sounds like you've already done and and so much in the past year. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but do any of these things kind of lead, like, where do you think you'll be in, you know, the five, 10 year time mm -hmm. frame? And, yeah. um, you know, what, when you think of like Nanum 2.0, like where, where do you think you'd like to be in terms yeah. of, you know, it's interesting that you say Nanum 2.0, cause like, that's a kind of a buzzword with, you know, internally and we're like, oh yeah, yeah. by Nanum 2.0, we'll have <laughs> this, this and that. Um, you know, we, right, right now we have a lot of the basics down, um, whether that's real time collaboration like accurate, scientifically accurately displaying, you know, atoms and bonds, like a lot of that, you know, you know, it's, even though we're a software company, like the field of computational chemistry and molecular simulation is again, very sophisticated. And so I personally like to think that we're m much more akin to like a deep tech co company and like just laying down the foundation for a collaborative molecular simulation and modeling app, like took, you know, three to four years, uh, which yeah. was really kind of the core of, of the development for the past uh, four or five years. Um, but there's a bunch of th different things that we want to do. Um, and also keep in mind that we've been really optimizing for the kind of medicinal chemistry um, as uh, a use case. And, um, you know, we're already starting to get traction with uh, process chemistry uh, and drug development, which, um, you know, if you're not familiar, like drug discovery and drug development and process chemistry is a whole, almost a whole different world uh, within the microcosm of, of pharma. And so um, what's interesting is that, you know, these these process chemists and, and drug um, development scientists like don't typically talk as much to uh, the drug discovery people. And in fact, we've heard horror stories of, you know, big pharma companies of uh, that and process uh, chemists that, uh, or drug discovery scientists that took two years to get one single molecule as a, you know, lead candidate. And then they pass it over to the, uh, the process chemists or the drug uh, development people who are in charge of making, you know, five kilograms of, the drug opposed to five milligrams and they're like oh no we can't do this and so you know within two days they would get like rejected and so you know getting those types of scientists in the loop faster and more effectively and in, uh, in an intuitive manner within our environment um, i think i just painted the picture i think only for like the next two to three years um, mm -hmm. but we've had to turn down projects um, for like material science and uh, chemical engineering scientists that wanted to use our software but needed a different simulation algorithm or, or needed a different visualization um, method uh, and things like that. And so those are kind of, um, you know, areas that we're, we're highly um, uh, uh, interested in exploring. Um, another thing uh, that I think in the next five to 10 years that we're very excited about is uh, we're just launching, um, and, and this is kind of the third pillar, which is the integrated portion. Um, a lot of uh, scientists, like I said, use different types of simulation algorithms and things like that. Uh, but um, they don't necessarily have time to make their own kind of integration package to like integrate it within their own workflow. Um, but academia does. Um, in fact, we've seen a ton of interest from academia uh, saying, that, oh, they want to make their own uh, plug-in modules so that they can plug in their own simulation algorithms and things like that. And so we're just now starting to open up this ecosystem of uh, scientists and researchers that want to make their own uh, integration module uh, for nano. Um, and so eventually what we really want to do is to have this ecosystem where they could start sharing these types of plugins and integration modules, kind of like a mini app store um, within our own platform so that then, you know, people can get uh, uh, attribution and even contribution, like get a cut of, you know, a certain simulation algorithm that they use or, and things like that. Because um, a lot right now, the kind of the, the um, field of computational chemistry and molecular simulation, I would say is, is, uh, pretty flat, fragmented, you know, there's research groups that they're doing their own thing. People are skeptical about this other research group because they don't trust this one author or whatever. And so like, you know, having this, you know, one environment where people can constantly, you know, uh, rapidly try out, iterate on um, these different types of simulation packages is something that we're very passionate about as well. Um, so that's, I think, in, in the next uh, three to five year. Um, and then lastly, you know, right now we have real time, real time synchronous collaboration. Uh, but what we're really excited about is uh, what we like to call asynchronous collaboration or um, spatial recording. So instead of like a video or an audio, let's say I build a molecule um, and then I'm like, here's how I built it. And then I record the whole thing. But, and then you as a user can play back that recording, but then hit pause midway and be like, oh, what if I did, you know, this to this part, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and not only is that something that, you know, our pharma um, users are excited about because, 
as you know, in, in San Diego, it's, it's a really a pain to try to talk to those people in Europe <laughs> in, early in the morning sometimes. Uh, but also, um, you know, in academia, it's huge, right? So um, if you can imagine kind of like a Khan Academy, but in 3D, where you can also interact with um, the models that you're working with. Um, those are all these different types of things that we still want to add to the platform. Um, and that's not even, you know, taking into consideration the, the kind of the immediate next steps that we still need to do to further work into our workflow of our current users. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what the, the product looks like for the next, I want to say, five to ten years. Yeah, really exciting stuff. So, you know, something you said about the medicinal chemists, uh, discovery chemists, and, and then the process chemists, you know, really kind of cued me in on, obviously, you know, be, being able to produce molecules that are um, easily synthesizable um, mm -hmm. is, is another thing. Mm -hmm. And also things that, you know, maybe have um, medicinal chemistry properties, like, for mm -hmm. instance, bio, uh, bioavailability, mm -hmm. things like that. Are those things that you have modules to be able to optimize, to be able yeah. to say, you know, bioavailability all the way through to, the, is this, you know, compound easily synthesizable? Can it be scaled? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's something that's in the works or is that something that you already have in, in the system? Um, so we have some basic cheminformatics and bioinformatics mm -hmm. uh, modules that are not calculated within our software, but are calculated with a different software. And then you can see the results directly in virtual reality. Um, so like you said, bioavailability, PK, like all those different types of, um, you know, indicators that you'd want to usually see, like that, that's something that we already support in terms of optimizing for them, like, you know, taking into account those variables and then making the changes at the same time. Um, that's, I think, a future thing. If you have a, a, a package in mind, that we, we're, we can already integrate it. But yeah. if it's not uh, already available, then that's something that, you know, we want to be able to do as well. I think that also takes some supercomputing power to, <laughs> to real time optimize that, yeah. that kind of thing. So but that, that's interesting. You have it integrated. Great. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about, you've talked about some of the traction you've gotten in, in the collaborations you're working on, especially mm -hmm. in the past year, but how have you funded the company at this point? And, yeah. and what, are, what does that look like in terms of, you know, uh, building the company and, and funding? Is it government, VC? Mm -hmm. How have you done it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a very interesting approach. And this also goes into kind of our next five to 10 years as well directly. Um, so in 2017, we did uh, kind of a convertible note around with a, a strategics and um, uh, some angels, local angels in San Diego. So one of our investors uh, is HTC actually uh, from HTC Vive. Uh, but we are <laughs> required to stay agnostic for, for hardware. So we don't have to prefer their hardware. Um, so, one of, you know, they're one of our investors. And then uh, we also did another round uh, last year, actually, um, with uh, a more strategics, uh, including a, a Japanese gaming VC. So that was also really great to see um, as well. And then and some couple other angels. We're actually working on a round right now um, that's almost about to be finished up. So I can't share details yet, but hopefully we'll be able to share uh, details uh, later uh, this year as well. Um, so that's kind of been uh, funding, been uh, on kind of the traditional route of like convertible notes. Um, in 2017, another thing that we did that I hope won't derail our conversation um, is uh, we actually did a, a blockchain token sale. Um, and so what this means is that uh, just like you sell Chuck E. Cheese tokens um, at Chuck E. Cheese, we sold our own tokens, uh, which were called matrix tokens. Um, and so those are actually on the Ethereum blockchain. And uh, what that enables, the, the, our blockchain feature um, so basically, you can think about it as a separate platform, or you can think about it as a button or a feature within our own VR environment, um, which is that it allows, you know, these chemicals that uh, Big Pharma creates, they could be worth billions of dollars, right? And we hear time and time again, these crazy stories where you just add, you know, one nitrogen or one oxygen to this one, you know, chemical group, and then bam, like, it, you know, it wasn't working before, now it works now, right? And so these one atom differences are worth billions of dollars. Um, and so, and one of the things that you know, blockchain is really, really good at is immutably proving something um, or having an immutable record. Um, and so what this blockchain feature does, uh, Matrix, is that it allows our users to immutably uh, timestamp their creation and their edits of um, their molecular designs onto the blockchain so that then later they can be like, hey, like I created this, I made this change, um, here's why, I, you know, hopefully I deserve this patent. Um, so, you know, with the U.S. Uh, patent administration, there's like a bunch of debate between first to file versus first to invent. We like to call first to hash uh, because you hash it onto the, the uh, blockchain. Um, this enables you, what's interesting is that it, you can keep it secret, but also sh prove that you uh, submitted it at that uh, point um, at the same time. So it's kind of like this weird hybrid. 
uh, obviously we're not legal experts. We're, we're not going to say that this will become the legal standard. We just see this as like kind of a supplement to be able to prove that, you know, um, uh, if you, that you have a strong case for you inventing that. So uh, because of that, we uh, actually sold about like uh, $1.7 million worth of, of tokens then. Uh, and then we did another, like uh, the total amount of convertible notes that we did was 1.7. So total uh, capital injection today is about $3.5 million. That, I think, I feel like we should have a whole conversation about that alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's something I'm not very familiar with. I'm just a simple biochemist. So I <laughs> really don't know anything about blockchain stamping and things. Um, but I do think, you know, what you mentioned as far as um, the timestamp, mm -hmm. maybe that is not as interesting given this first to file, you mm -hmm. know, obviously implications, at least mm -hmm. in, U in the U.S., but I do see that if you're in this community environment where you do have people all iterating mm -hmm. and you have, or you are able to stamp when someone makes a change or actually creates a molecule in that mm -hmm. person and can create ownership, that to me seems like, you know, potentially yeah. a way to, you know, be able to claim like, okay, that's the inventive step there, yeah. right? Well, so and that's just one use. Look at that. Yeah. yeah. And that's just one use of the tokens. Like, yeah. as I mentioned before, the asynchronous collaboration or spatial recording as well as uh, people creating their own integration modules. Like, you know, you, if you wanted to use our own in-game in or like in-app currency to be able to pay for somebody, like this is the means to do that. Uh, so it's not just for the time stamping, it's a, yeah. just the kind of a currency for the entire ecosystem. And we're just starting to build that. So it's, our, well, the, the blockchain actually um, platform is already alive and we've completed that. Um, so most of our efforts right now on the, are on the VR side, um, but as we build this community and as we build this ecosystem, uh, then that's going to play more and more of a crucial role. Very cool stuff. Well, I had no, I didn't know that background about the yeah. uh, <laughs> the fundraising through that through that mechanism. Very cool. Um, all right, so just to kind of take it, I guess. Oh, sorry. Well, Kara, Kara, one question for you. Like, so Nanom is part of the J Labs program. Is that correct? Yes, they so are. Talk yes. a little bit about yeah. Talk a little bit about J Labs and and sort of how did you guys meet and how did they become part of J Labs and all that. Yeah, sure. Be happy to to talk through a little bit of that. And actually, wanted to kind of chime in um, when you mentioned in Silico is also a J Labs company. So oh yeah. yeah. That's one of those things that, you know, really, um, you know, the ecosystem we've created. So um, as, as Kata uh, mentioned, um, we are in San Diego. I'm based in San Diego too. So I know that this team pretty well here and, and the local team and also Steve, the CEO. Um, and so, you know, what we do is we uh, forge a lot of relationships with universities and entrepreneurs um, through a lot of our programming um, and Nanom applied to join J Labs. Um, what happens is we actually have a lot of our medicinal chemists, computational chemists and, and things, in this case, review the application and, and kind of talk, uh, give, a, give a feeling for, you know, where they kind of see Nanom fitting into not only the innovation ecosystem, but potentially how we might be able to, you know, work with MSJ and J and how they add kind of value. Um, you know, at J, at J Labs, we're really looking for companies that offer a, a novel approach um, that have uh, a new way of looking at things, um, a solve unmet need, um, and also great teams. So that's a, those are the main things we look for. So um, based on those principles, we invited Nanom to join uh, J Labs. I believe it's the end of 2018. Um, to, to join the join the ecosystem that we have here. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been really interesting because, um, you know, a lot of our companies are therapeutics companies and, you know, they have clear colorless liquid in a tube. It's not much to show off, but Nanom has really sparked kind of the imagination of everyone because they come, you know, to some of our happy hours and things and we, we have a system set up and everyone's really eager to use the, use the approach that they've developed, um, be able to test it out for themselves. Um, and, you know, in Silico, um, like Kata mentioned, is, is a company that's also based at J-Labs, but they're actually all the way uh, in, in Asia, in Shanghai is, is where their main site is. So being able to focus on, you know, having companies that are collaborating across the ecosystem is also really interesting. Um, and so, um, and as you mentioned, you know, in terms of J&J, &J, um, certainly being able to collaborate across many different 
um, you know, time zones um, across many different fields, I think is, is, you know, really interesting in terms of also being able to um, have different groups that maybe speak different languages, right? You have the medicinal chemists that speak one language, you have the biologists that speak another, and then you have the structural biologists, you know, crystallographers, all those people, but everyone can instantly visually see in the system, you know, how things are put together and actually iterate and work in the same space. So I I think that that really breaks down a lot of the silos in terms of being able to um, work in this field. Um, and, and as you know, I'm, I'm actually a structural biologist, uh, crystallographer by training as well, and really appreciate the fact that, you know, some of the best um, protein folders, they call them, so the people who are able to structurally minimize, uh, you know, energies and these proteins and, and fold were, were totally people who had no biochemical background whatsoever. So you really wow. don't know where the innovation comes from, right? So having people with different backgrounds collaborating and working in a space is, is really interesting. Is this one of the first VR companies in JLabs? Yeah, it is actually. So we have a, a couple in the, um, I want to say the medical device space, um, you know, looking mm -hmm. at uh, ways to train surgeons and things um, and way to visualize either um, uh, surgeries or implants or, um, you know, any, any type of um, imaging for um, let's say if there's been a trauma or something else, we have a lot of, you know, I wouldn't say a lot, but a few in that space. Um, this mm -hmm. is really the only company I could think of that's in, um, that we have in the portfolio that's um, in the VR space in uh, therapeutics. Um, so mm -hmm. oh, we don't come across them too often. Very good. I presume this means maybe more in your future though. That'd be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kato, one question. You mentioned in your description that it's uh, Minecraft for matter, I believe was the phrase. Yeah. So that was, that was my one question is that, you know, obviously in Minecraft, there's all these worlds and the nether and the end and all that kind of stuff. I mean, do you guys create the entire, all the molecules and stuff yourself? I mean, you talk about working in collaboration with, you know, computational and giant computers and all that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, a lot of, so uh, kind of our main database that we interact with is called the uh, Worldwide Protein Data Bank. Um, or RCSB PDB, um, and uh, they are actually based, uh, well, they have headquarters all over the world, but um, there's one actually headquartered at uh, UC San Diego. So that was one of our key yeah. collaborations early on. And they have over a couple hundred thousand uh, proteins known to mankind uh, that are already uh, available to atomic precision, essentially. Um, and so these are data uh, or files that essentially have, you know, a 3D coordinate, X, Y, Z, and then they have an element type. Um, and then, you know, a bond, right, that connects them to another atom. Um, and so uh, that's like one of our main databases uh, that we interact with, but there's also others like um, uh, Drug Bank, uh, which is another one that's more on the small molecule side. Um, there's also uh, PubChem, which is another one that's uh, more kind of agnostic when it comes to just like general chemical compounds. Um, and so these are databases that uh, our scientists pull from in order to start initially designing. Uh, but that it isn't limited to that. And especially we see on our kind of academic side is that, uh, you know, we have a, a basic kind of like tilt brush for molecules type uh, interface where you can just start building with molecular functional groups and, uh, and you can pull up the entire periodic table. So if you want to build from scratch, you know, an entire couple thousand atom structure, you, you could totally do that. Um, but it obviously it takes much longer than just importing something that we already uh, know, so. Cool, that's very cool. Well, we, we did have, uh, is it okay? If we're gonna share this video with the audience later, so it'll be available for folks. Is it okay if we share your email addresses with folks? If, yeah, please. Uh, anybody in the audience? Yeah, I see a question okay, that's from fantastic. The, the audience as well uh, from Melanie. I don't know if, we'll, if we wanna wait for that or not. Well, I mean, if you wanna address that, that'd be fine. Yeah, oh yeah, it's just, uh, I think um, the, the, they're just asking for help on uh, evaluating effectiveness uh, for our, our tool for teaching. Uh, we're very open to that. Um, uh, we actually are you know, like constantly applying for academic grants and things like that, especially because, um, you know, one of the most difficult kind of aspects that we um, find uh, is trying to balance which features to build for academic or pharma. Um, and because of our revenue comes from pharma, we need to kind of, you know, cater a lot of our features to them. Uh, but, you know, our mission isn't just to make super high end tools for mega pharmas like we do want to create better tools for everybody and lower the barrier to entry. So um, this is something that we're, we're very passionate about and we're actively doing. So definitely interested and uh, feel free to reach out to my email. Great. Thank you both for taking the time with us today. This has been great. It's really been awesome to hear about Nanome and 
Kara, thanks for giving us the JLab's perspective. I really appreciate both your time. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks so much, Mark. Thanks for having us. Take care. Thank you, guys. Our next session will begin at 2.10. So uh, anybody who's sticking around, you want to come back, go get uh, some juice or something, and we'll see you in 20 minutes or so. Thanks. Thanks again.